right, nice job. Good set. Let's do some social kick. Welcome back to another episode of the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got a full crew in the outdoor studio here today. Luke Paddington, Dr. John Mullen, and a bearded Rowdy Gaines joining us. From <laughs> What's up, Rowdy? How are you? Brian, good to see you, my friend. Can I say War Eagle on this? Yeah, not? you can say <laughs> War Eagle. Yeah. I was <laughs> waiting for it. What did it make? 10 seconds? Right five there, seconds? Right in. there in the backyard of the Florida Gators. You can say War Eagle to me, buddy. Uh, I know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough to say that. Well, you're out in California, so it's no problem. Nobody knows what War Eagle means out there. so Not a clue. They don't know college sports at all around here. But at all. No one knows. How did, he, how did you swim on the 84 Olympic team and the head coach was an Alabama coach? How did that work out? <laughs> you know, it's funny, Luke. It, it, it's funny, actually. And that's why I never really had a problem with Alabama during my career is because, first of all, we beat them every single meet. Um, <laughs> same for me. Um, same. Yeah, right, right. The same thing with you. So, um, and, and the coach at Alabama at the time was a really just a wonderful man. And uh, just, just Dan, Don Gambrell was his name and, and yep. just a great coach. I mean, he coached some amazing athletes in the 60s 70s and 80s and uh you know he was the head coach of the olympic team so uh i i owe him a lot to my career believe it or not obviously my coach richard quick was was the man that meant the most to me eddie reese another one but don gamble was a big part of my life for sure he said something to me when i was 10 years old he came down to trinidad he did a national team had a camp and don was their coach and i remember being a 10 year old saying Rowdy Gaines' coach just told me that he could coach backstroke blindfolded because all he needed to know was you slapping the water when you were back. And I was like, ah. Rowdy Gaines, Rowdy's coach is not Don Gambro. I was like, well, okay, and slapping the water. I'll never forget that moment from 1984, so heads up. I'll be darned. Well, you know, he, he never really, no, he never did coach me, but but in a way he influenced me, you know, and there's, right. there's, there's, there's that fine line, you know. I mean, there's one thing to coach, but to actually be a mentor and and somebody that was a big part of your career, uh, you know that's a, that's another story, and it doesn't have to be somebody that works with you day in and day out. It could be anybody, really. And and for me, one of those people was Don Gamble, who is, by the way, still alive and doing well, living in Tuscaloosa, and and uh, and a, and an historic figure in our sport. Well, speaking of day to day, uh, a good a friend of ours, friend of the podcast, uh, and uh, a guy who I was on a relay with, Nathan Adrian, was just you know hitting us up uh, recently for pools that we he we knew of in the area where he could come train. So he came and trained at the place that we swim masters now, uh, and so we wanted to talk to you about some of the work that you are doing through uh, through USA Swimming and you know the Aquatics Coalition to to help us with that. Can you talk about it? Well, yeah, you know, we're, I'm part of uh, the Aquatics Coalition, as you mentioned. And basically, Brian, what it is, is it, it, it's it's a, a bunch of water safety organizations, competitive NGBs. We have um, all four water sports NGBs, USA Diving, Synchro. Um, um, and then, we, of course, we have USA Swimming, which really was uh, the the group that decided, hey, we really need to do something to figure out a way to open our pools. That That's basically what it is, is. We're trying to influence those policymakers, those public of health officials to do whatever they can to open swimming pools. I mean, it's not rocket science. And, and, and we're basically saying we want to do it for purpose driven aquatics. We're not interested in just swinging the doors open and let every Tom, Dick, Dick and Harry come in. We're we're saying, listen, we need to get back to teaching kids how to swim. We need to get our kids back in the pool for competitive aquatics. Um, and you know, therapy, whatever it is, but it has to be purpose driven. And it, it breaks my heart when I see pools close. And, you know, we were just talking, Brian, about the fact that, you know, I live here in Orlando and I used to work for the Y and I got, you know, I got laid off six months ago, but, um, but they, they we had 22 pools and I think only six or seven are open now. So it, it's really heartbreaking to see that. And Rowdy, it's not just in the States, it's all across the world going on right now. So in Trinidad and Tobago, where I'm from, just on the national news last night, the, the entire swimming community got a spot in the news to argue the exact same case that you arguing as well. It's, it's purpose-driven swimming. It's not just to go and, have, and cool off in, in the water. And these are livelihoods. These are jobs. This is an economy. And, and, and these are people's lives moving forward because you, you're missing out massive time in the pool, not training, etc. So what advice would you 
I mean, like, what's the one argument would you say? Is, is it it's that? It's like, listen, we, we, it's a livelihood. It's important to learn to swim. It's people's jobs. What's that one argument that you find people listen to and make them go, huh, you're right. We need well, to make a change. Well, look, well, well first of all, yeah, it, it's economically devastating for, right. for our club system worldwide, as you said. But I, I'm just thinking more United States. Sure. Um, it's completely devastating economically. And, and a lot of businesses are economically devastated. I get that. Um, but swimming is the only sport that can save your life, you mm -hmm. know, and I think one, one of, one of my passion, uh, over the last 15 or 20 years is, is making sure that, um, uh, communities are aware of how important water safety is. I know we're in the middle of a pandemic, but drowning mm -hmm. is, is an epidemic in our country. It is the number one cause of death in children four and under the number two cause of death in children 14 and under. So uh, when pools close, we don't teach kids how to swim and kids drown. I get a Google alert on my phone every time a child drowns and I get six or seven a day. And uh, you're talking about heartbreaking. It literally, literally breaks my heart when I see that because I, I think in most cases, not every case, but in most cases, it's so unnecessary because all those children had to do was take swim lessons because it's been proven. I hate to throw stats at you, but it's been proven that if you take swim lessons, it reduces that risk of drowning by 90%. So it's clearly important that we open pools to be able to, for me personally, to teach children how to swim. Again, forget about the economic impact, forget about the competitive part, which is obviously incredibly important. For me, it, it's, it's getting kids children in there to be able to learn how to swim or at least how to be safer in the water not everybody's got the luxury of a, a pop-up pool like luke has or an endless pool in their backyard school has gone virtual swimming can't go virtual no <laughs> so you gotta open no it. they it, it can't i mean it, it you know <laughs> no it can't and, and rowdy we just connected a jamal hill who is um who's aimed to to teach one million uh -oh. there, there he is right, you're back you're back yep i'm back yeah. So yeah, we just connected with Jamal Hill, whose aim is to teach one million swimmers how to swim by the year 2025, I believe was the goal. And he's raising money and he's and he's gonna be on our show and he's asked that we help contribute. And I think how we help contribute is not just financially, that's a huge thing, but it's a message. It's it's the importance, it's the sharing, it's it's the care and the love that we have at all levels. So do you know about what Jamal is doing as well? Are you yeah, young? oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely, I've heard of that great cause and uh... We, we need about a uh, hundred of those um, out there in the country to have that kind of passion uh, sure. like uh, his organization does. And like you were saying, a lot of these pools are closed and obviously a lot of drownings happen in low income areas. Are there a disproportionate amount of pools staying closed in those areas compared to, you know, nice country clubs that people often associate with swimming, at least elite swimming? They do, John. Uh, and in fact, I'll give you an example is Washington, D.C. Um, they b literally have closed their pools all year long. So in 2020, no pools, no public pools in D.C. will open. Um, uh -huh. and, and what we're trying to say and what we're trying to tell the mayor is um, we have I say we I there are a lot of smart people on this uh, coalition, guys. I mean, obviously the NGBs, but we have all these water safety organizations, um, YMCA, Red Cross, uh, Tara, Tara Kirk, you might remember yeah. that name. Of course, yeah, yeah, uh, she's in the area. A, a great Olympian, yeah, it's, yeah, that's right. Um, she's a Johns Hopkins virologist, for, uh, you know, so she's like one of the smartest people in the world. Anyway, she's on our, our coalition. So a lot of people have put together this, this plan to be able to present to these officials and say, guys, we can make it if I could just have five minutes with these people, we could yeah. say we can do this. We can do it safely and we can probably do it economically feasible for you. That's the thing. And I get it. And if you think about D.C. and what's happened to that city over the last six months, a million different things. Um, I get it where swimming pools might not be uh, important, but I still don't understand why we can't get five minutes with that, that group of people. Now, for every D.C., we also have a whole state of Michigan, for example, and the fact that we were able to get to the governor, present the plan to the governor, 
and they opened their pools a couple of weeks ago. So there are success stories, definitely. But, John, there are a lot of stories, like you said, disproportionately in those low income neighborhoods. African-Americans are five times more likely to drown than a Caucasian child. So there are a lot of cases where in those underserved communities, pools aren't opening and they're not planning opening anytime soon especially now as we head into the fall because uh you know the outdoor pools are a lot easier to open than indoor pools and those indoor pools are probably going to stay closed for a long time well let's tell dc that they've got a pro swim team so they they <laughs> ought to support the sport of swimming <laughs> and, and pool access right. so right. It, even even as we've started to see you know we went through the period of all pools closed and we, we've started to see some open up some of which probably through the through the progress of this organization and um, but that doesn't mean that we'll have competitions. And, and so we've got, you know, certain there's schools that are redshirting their entire team or, you know, conferences, even in football that aren't playing or deciding not to play. We don't know what's going to happen about the swim season and what knock on effect that may have to student athletes as they took a gap year this year. And now they're kind of forced to come back or maybe they don't. It's throwing a whole wrench in just the career of of athletes and especially student athletes. So programs getting cut, Iowa, William Mary. Yeah. 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 And, 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 uh, LaSalle just LaSalle kind of LaSalle recently. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, like as, as someone so connected to the sport of swimming yourself, what, uh, who've, you've probably mm -hmm. talked to some college coaches and athletes about their experiences through this and what they're thinking about. Um, you know, what's, what's been your observation of, you know, the dynamic within, within the, the landscape of the sport of swimming right now, how people are dealing with it and how they're preparing to be successful with the unknown. Well, Brian, a lot of it, it, it goes back to what you were talking about, John, a second ago about, you know, the, uh, the underserved communities being disproportionately, uh, you know, abused in a way with their pools not opening. Well, the same thing applies to those competitive swimmers because there are a lot of communities where the pools are bounding like Florida. I mean, you know, the governor is, is pretty conservative and, uh, he said, "Let's get the let's get this economic engine running again." And he started opening pools back in May, you know. And then there's other states like Michigan who just opened a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, it, it, that's the problem. Or some kids, especially those kids that are seeking scholarships to colleges, you know, it, it's so disproportionate, it's so unfair across the board. And I don't know if I I don't know if I have an answer. If I did, I'd be a rich person, I guess. Right now, I guess I guess the answer would be. And, and, and this is one big cliche, guys. I know it sounds so corny, but it, it's just to have hope. You know, I, I tell those kids, I probably have been on, now I do know how to do Zoom, believe it or not. I don't know how to do this, <laughs> but I do know how to do Zoom. So I've probably been on 60 Zoom calls because all I have to do is punch a button. Anyway, 60 Zoom calls over the last six months. And I've talked to uh, high schools, colleges, pro team. I spoke to the Indiana pros um, a couple months ago. And I just tell them, you know, it, things are going to work out okay. You know, we're going to get back to normal. You know, there's a rule of thumb. You guys should know this. It, it's Rowdy's rule of thumb, by the way. It has, it has no scientific evidence, by the way, Doc. Um, yeah, this is just Rowdy evidence. But every day you're out of the water, it takes about a half a day to get the feel back to the water. So, for example, if you're out of the water for two weeks, it's going to take you about a week to get – to get the hang of it again, right? To get the feel of water. I'm an old man, so, It took me like two years. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. For us now, you're right, buddy. For two weeks for me, you might as well just, it's a death sentence, right? Um, but, but for kids, and this is especially true for kids, you know, they're so resilient. Hey, okay, so you're out of the water four months. Okay, it's going to take you two months to get back into it. Two months. It's going to take you two months. But after two months, it's going to be back to normal, so to speak. So, that's why I try to tell them, I just have hope. We're going to get back to normal. I, I, I 100 percent believe that we're going to we're going to beat this. I 100 percent believe that we're going to have an Olympics next summer. Um, and, you know, it might not be normal anymore, but I 100 percent believe that we will get back to where uh, we're going to be back to swimming like it like it used to be. Again, it might look a little different, but we're going to be swimming again. I was going to drop in history and just confirm this is right. So after 80, you took six months out. You, you stopped after 1980 for six months. Is that correct? And Absolutely. you broke, you, and you saw, you saw John T. break the world record. John T. go 49-4. And you're like, he, he mm -hmm. tore it up in that four-foot pool. And then mm -hmm. you're like, you know what? I'm going to come back. And you beat John T.'s record and you mm -hmm. nailed it up 200 free. You came back 
on fire and you were on fire in world champs before um ata you were on fire before that you took that six mm -hmm. months out you were crushed it affected you i'm sure it affected you mentally and mm -hmm. you came back stronger than ever talk about that talk about you know how you come back after this as well well and, and that's why i feel like that i can empathize a little bit yeah. with with what everybody's going through with these kids and what they're going through because uh, again it's a little different because you know i i now is a matter of life and death and back then it was more of a life and death of a career so it, it, yeah. it is a little different but i can empathize with the feelings that we all went through all of us went through this of of denial i mean did you think that the, the, that week that, that, you know, NBA started canceling games and they started canceling college tournaments and swim meet, it was total denial, like it's not going to happen. And then it turns into anger, like you get really angry that this is going down. And then you get, and then the biggest period for me was a grieving period, you know, where you get yeah. really, really sad. You, you, you go through a depression. Um, and then it comes into an acceptance phase, which a lot of people are in right now, and then turns into motivation. So I, I can empathize what everybody's going through right now. Um, and for me, yeah, I was out of the water when I, you know, when I retired, because that's what I did. I retired back then. There was no money in swimming. Um, I worked as a night clerk at a hotel for two years before the Olympics from the 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. shift for two Mike years. Mike also made sandwiches, he told us. He said he made sandwiches in 1980 as well. I, you guys yeah, yeah. I, I lived off a lot of macaroni and cheese, let me tell you. Um, but but anyway, we all did. It wasn't just me. We all did. Um, and and um, and so, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't swim. I didn't get in the water for six months. Uh, and more, more so than the world record and everything, which was, you know, awesome. I'm very proud of it was I went my best time in the 500 freestyle. I went from 424 to 419, um, uh, about yeah. five, yeah, about five, about five months after I started swimming again. So that's, that's the point I try to tell them is, you know, yeah, man, the first three months I was hurting, dude. Um, I was, I was in a lot of pain for three months, but then I got over it and then I was back to normal, you know? And uh, that's why I that's why that's why I get corny with the word hope is the fact that, you know, uh, these swimmers that have been out of the water and, and have had some really tough things to have to work through um, these last seven months or so, it, 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 it's going to get better and you have to have hope. Definitely. And you mentioned how, you know, like your story, how you improved after a break. And we know swimming's a sport of, you know, overtraining and doing a lot of volume. So I do have that hope with you as well, where there's going to be a lot of great times and breakthroughs ahead at hopefully NCAAs. And as you alluded to the 2021 Olympics, you sound very confident that that's going to happen. How do you envision it happening? Is it with fans, without fans? Are we doing a Zoom opening ceremonies? <laughs> what, what is that looking like to you? Are you at home commentating? Uh, I have no knowledge. I have not okay. been told by NBC. No, no, no. I, I don't know anything. Um, I'm a dummy. Uh, but I, I, mm -hmm. I have feelings, you know, and my gut tells me, uh, first of all, back up a second and, and just understand how incredible the Japanese people are. Um, they're time. some of the, the most kindest, <laughs> humble, uh, wonderful, smartest people on the planet. And they've worked so hard to make this happen. And the good news in, in this being in 2021 is we we have a year to figure out this out, right? So if you look at the NBA and if you look at the NHL and 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 look and those leagues did it right. And then you look at Major League Baseball and then NFL, they got some things right, they got some things wrong. I think the the experiments that are going on now will really help the Olympic movement a year from now. They're gonna yeah. be able to really study what worked. And what didn't, and mm -hmm. they're going to be able to apply that to the Olympic Games. Now it's a little different because the NBA has you know two or three hundred athletes, and now we've got ten thousand coming together. So getting back to your question, is it going to is it going to have fans? I don't know. Um, I, I think you're going to have three different scenarios. You're going to have one A uh, scenario A. It's going to be just like every Olympics. It's going to be right. packed, normal. Everybody might have a mask on, but everybody's going to be in. And then B, there's going to be um, you know it's going to be half filled, full of uh, you know, corporate big wigs and family members, and then see, yeah, there's not going to be, to be anybody in the stands. Um, and they're going to limit a lot of the officials and families. And, you know, it's, it's going to be a really bare bones Olympic Games. But 
again, I, I have no knowledge of this. Nobody but knows. I, but, but nobody, nobody knows. knows. All these. Nobody not, knows. Nobody can have accurate products. We don't know a year from now. We don't you know. know. You're you right. You could be commentating on the Olympic Games from where you are right now. Uh, my high school colleague, Arthur Bolden, is the U of track and field for NBC. He had to comment his first Diamond League game from his house in, in Miramar, you know, just mm -hmm. like you. That's completely new for you. That might be the reality. You might be there live. We don't know. Yep. ISL takes off in 11 days. These guys, these athletes. Oh, I'll be there either. in 11 days. <laughs> oh, you're going to ISL? Oh, yes. Right. Well, seven six, weeks. seven weeks in Market Island then. There Beautiful you go. place. Well, so I want to ask you about that because you swam in a day where there weren't these other professional yeah. opportunities. There weren't hard. I mean, maybe some sponsorship. There wasn't money. Yeah, there wasn't money. At all. So I mean, so at, you were the the old man at 25, right? And then mm -hmm. you know, in this era, we've got Irvin winning gold at 35. Mm -hmm. So the the age is totally different. The the sponsorship opportunities and the monetary opportunities are different. So. Uh, what impact do you think that the ISL and perhaps some of these other evolutions of, you know, champion series and, and things like that have on the longevity of athletes and uh, how they approach, you know, where, how long will their career be? I, I think it's great, Brian, for the athletes. I think it's wonderful. Uh, you know, I, I felt like a little bit that we ushered in that era. 1984 was really the last Olympics that it was strictly amateur. We weren't allowed to take money, by the way. There was no professional opportunity because we weren't even allowed. It was basically an NCAA-type ruling in, in 1984. So um, 88 was – it, it kind of ushered in that a little bit, era a little bit. 88 was the last Olympics that had college basketball players. Um, 92 was our first dream team. So swimming kind of followed that path a little bit. Uh, Matt Biondi and Tom Jager really kind of exploded – um, that that era of professionalism, but I think myself and Tracy Calkins and Steve Lundquist and Mary T and some of the great names of swimming um, before me, obviously, but um, but but certainly during my time, uh, we felt like we ushered in that era, and and I think, and 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 now they're reaping the benefits of what what that era ushered in, and I think it's wonderful that these, the I call them kids because that's what they are to me. I have most of my kids are all older than them, but. Um, but you know it's great for them it's great for them to have these kinds of opportunities uh, and 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 i i say it's about time you know i, I think it's it's uh, it's really cool that they're that that you're able able to earn a living swimming can you imagine i i mean i can't even imagine saying that but a lot of kids are doing that they're they're making a living by swimming and uh, at 25 i was the third oldest swimmer in history to win a gold medal and now that's the average age of the olympic team well, now you're a swimming lifer. You're always out rocking masters meets, and I always see you in the pool, staying in shape and, and fit. So, shoot, if there was ISL, you would be rocking a, a 50 skins. Wouldn't you? <laughs> I would not be able to stay even remotely close to the women, much less the men. <laughs> Seriously. The speed, but if that opportunity were there in your day, don't you think you would have torn up the ISL? It, it would have yeah, been great. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I would yeah, have. That was suited for you. Yeah, no, I, I think it would have been, yeah. Now we got IM skins or pick your own. Right, right. We would have had a good time with that. Same with you, buddy. I mean, you know, you you would have been tearing it up too, my my friend. So. Know, Nathan Adrian lactic acid. Range. <laughs> 20 lactate after number two. But I will tell you that I came along in perfect timing because I came along post Mark Spitz and pre Matt Biondi. So I'm, I re I'm not real sure I want to be a part of another era because Rowdy. then I'd have to end up facing Nathan or Michael Phelps. I, I, I came along and uh, the timing for me was really good. Rowdy, in 1980, the Olympics happened. Rowdy went. Who was the top 100 freestyler? Who was the top 200 freestyler? Who would have been on the 4x1 free, 4x1 medley, 4x2 free? How does that U.S. team would have done? Sorry, I, my, my, just heads up. So don't don't sell yourself short. You as a rowdy gains area in 1980, dude. Well, 1980, yeah, you're right. You're right, Luca. That was my best my best year of swimming, no I doubt. Saw I saw what the Russians were, and I saw what the East Germans were, and I saw what you know the South Africans. Um, no, they didn't go, but I, I saw I saw what they did. I mean, you were you were right up there. That would have been your Olympic tear it up. So. Yeah, yeah, it it, it would have been my Olympics, but 
when I talk about the Olympics of, of 1980, I, I'm a little sheepish because I had my day in the sun in 1984. There were 336 athletes that made the team in 1980 that didn't make it in 76 and didn't make it in 84. Well, so for me, those are the real heroes, the, the people that you guys are even too young to probably remember. But no, the Bill no, we had no, sure. And one's a good buddy of yours, Craig Beardsley. We had, we, we had Craig on and Craig is one and then Glenn Mills. I mean, well, Craig Beardsley is the absolute epitome of there somebody we go. that should be in the Olympic Hall of Fame, the USA or the, the International Swimming Hall of Fame. He is the poster child of the 1980 Olympic team. The guy would have won the gold medal by two seconds. He, 158 low, he went with no goggles, no underwaters, grab starts. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. What he did in that it was. Pan oh, it's incredible. Yeah, he's a beautiful yeah. And he negative split. He, I mean, before yeah. Michael, he was coming back on everybody. Stronger yeah. than I it. So, yeah. Yeah, he, he was an amazing, amazing guy and still is a very dear friend. In fact, I literally just got a text from him about a half an hour ago. So from across He's America, what you guys friend. are doing. Yep. It's fantastic. Yep. Yep. That's fantastic. That's what it was him and Rob Butcher, actually. They were texting back and forth. And it's, nice. it, it, it's, it's breast cancer awareness month. There you go. Yeah. Hey, of the current generation, who who are you really excited to see what they could do this summer that you're just really hoping that they can hang on and deliver it next summer? <laughs> Um, well, you know, I, I always love a, a good comeback story. I, I'm a sucker for that. Uh, and uh, I think I saw every single Rocky movie. And, and, and I, you know, regardless of what you think of him as a person, and by the way, I think he's a wonderful person. I, you know, I'm pulling for Ryan Lochte, man. I, mm -hmm. I think it'd be really cool for 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 a guy that really went through, I don't know if you saw that documentary on him, but he, you know. Yeah. The grand they, they raked him over the coals in, in, in 2016, and some of it was warranted. You know, some of yeah. it he messed up on. A lot of it was, you know, was really unwarranted. But regardless, I pull for the guy. You know, I pull for those old guys. I pull for Anthony, and I'll pull for Nathan. Um, I'll pull for a lot of those older swimmers because I like to see that. I think it's good for swimming to have that kind of story. Certainly Nathan, you know, um, who is uh, a, another dear friend of mine that, that I love uh, – like a little brother and uh he he's he's got you know what a comeback story that would be and then you know i'm pulling for reagan smith you know and i'm <laughs> pulling for those young luca orlando and i'm, I'm pulling yeah. for the, a lot of the young kids too trust me yeah we'll see how many surprises there are at olympic trials if there aren't many meets leading up till then and then also like you said with reagan smith red shirting at stanford if she ends up going there or if perhaps she goes to olympics and wins i don't know how many golds we think she can win five or so if she decides to, you know, take sponsorship. Well, think about it. She, well Brian, she's got the 100 back, 200 back. Uh, medley. 400 medley relay, 400 mixed medley relay. Four right there. And yep. not, and none of them are gimmies, but, you know, four solid swims right there. And then she's got uh, that that all four won golds at, at the Worlds last summer. Yep. And then I think she's, I think if she That's wanted nice. to, she could win the gold medal in the 200 fly as well. Yeah. Say, two fly. And she's, she's, she's got a fly. Eight hundred free relay, yeah. So she's got yeah. a lot of a lot of possibilities out there. Yeah, but Rowdy, I mean, we know that you do your research like crazy before you swim meets. I mean, and you hit up your friends and your coaches. But as John was saying, what if trial shows up and we haven't seen much swimming for six and eight months, and all of a sudden some kid shows up in finals? And what are you gonna do? You're like uh, Luke Paddington. I met him like six months ago in the backyard. But yeah, that's, you know what I mean? Like it's gonna be cool, right? It's exciting. I, I don't know. I it. it <laughs> I, I honestly believe it's going to be the greatest Olympic Games in history next summer, greatest Olympic trials in history next summer, because we're all starving for that. You know, we're mm -hmm. all starving for that, that, for the world to come together. Um, you know, we're, we're so we're battling each other so much right now. There's so much divisiveness. And uh, and, and that, you know, the Olympics is the epitome of, of, of everybody coming together. And uh and the Olympic trials is is everybody in, the, in in America coming together. The swimming family, as you guys know, it's a very small family in many ways, and we all pull for each other. And we, uh, you know, we 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 really uh, we grieve when we lose uh, we lose one of us. So, you know, that young man that that uh, yeah, that Michigan. died at Michigan. Yeah, I mean yeah. that we, yeah. we all grieve for that. We all were. I you know I was very very sad and and. Um, and I didn't even know him. So it, it's it, we're a family. And I think coming together next summer would be the greatest thing ever. It's going to be interesting. The playing field is going to be viewed differently as well. We always view the playing field as the big superpowers of swimming. 
you know, they were good because of the establishments, because of the pools, because of the longevity, because coaches, of uh, the coaches, history. the money they have in swimming. And the, and it's on the smaller countries and the mid tier had always, you know, they excelled. You had the Hungries, you had the, the Francis excel. But now it's going to be like, well, who were able to keep their pools open for the whole year? Whereas who had serious government lockdowns? Who, like, like, like the Chinese are having their national chances right now. World record just got set. You know, like, know. like it's going to be like, that's a whole different playing field we have to analyze and rationalize. The Australians are not going to ISL because of the, of, of the COVID fits. Some people are not going to ISL because of COVID fits. It's, it's, it's going to be a very interesting now. The playing field gets shuffled to maybe lean towards helping other countries out that didn't follow. Anyway, just a side note. I'm, you're I'm, right. I'm, you're right, Luke. It, it is going to be weird, man. You're, you're going to see a lot of. You're going to see a lot of cases, certainly at our trials and the Olympics, where you're going to see kids you've never heard of um, do some incredible things. And, and that's right. what's that's what's so cool about it, too. Right. Exactly. Surprises, debate, things yeah. like that. That's what makes sport fun. And I, like yeah. I said, I think there's going to be some fast swimming. So looking forward to 2021. That's for sure. Okay. Look, Miami, Miami's in the NBA finals for crying out. Like, they, yeah. they, I they, made that they point were like the fifth seed in the East. All right, what's your prediction? How many games? What's going to happen? Uh, I, Down Lakers to one, right? Five. No, but it shows Lakers that when all the athletes have the same access to the same sleep, the same this, the same that, when you level playing field, it's end of the day, it's who's best on the day. And you're the same coach. It's or great. I'll just say, say like with ISL, they're there on Margaret Island. You're, you're seeing people around you. Like you said, the you conditions are so different. Yeah. If the Olympics have to do with two-week quarantine beforehand, We'll see. That might impact the psychology or the mental aspect for these athletes and really change the typical results. We're going to spend the next several months speculating. and that's uh, We'll speculate all the way up, and maybe we'll give you a call for some insider advice. <laughs> Rowdy, that's thanks good. for hanging out. It's been fun. That's it for this episode of the Social Kick Podcast, and uh, we'll see everybody. Rowdy, hang tight. We'll cut it right there. Thanks. Yeah, we, we cut it right there, Rowdy. We really enjoyed your time. Thank you, buddy. Thank you so much, guys. Enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to bed. I go to bed at nine o'clock, so I stay there. Yeah, thanks for staying up. Thanks for staying up, man. I appreciate it. Good to see you. (laughs) War Eagle, man. War Eagle. Bye. All right, later. Bye. See you.